Welcome to LTTV Weekly, um, number six, number seven, number five, whatever it is, not overly fussed, to be brutally honest. There's no days, there's no weeks at the moment. Joined by co-host, we agreed last week, Geordie, looking like you're in a different room than you've previously been in. So that's the big story tonight. Where are you coming to us from? Uh, same room, slightly different desk position, uh, right. enforced by a, a stolen power cable, to be quite honest with you. Um, so I've had to to move and adjust, but I'm quite enjoying the um, the fresh light coming through the window. Lovely. I've also moved. You didn't notice. Not great co-host duties from you just there, but that's fine. We're joined by a man this week who many supporters know, uh, head of brand, Chris Rose, and he has branded up his room because of his yeah, job I, title. I, I felt it was important because otherwise you were just going for some quite nice flowery curtains. So I think it was important to get some tigers in there with, with, with my job role. Well, we'll discuss your job role in a bit because I'm going to put a very simple question to you ex about exactly what a head of brand does. Um, but I'll look back on the week first. And obviously this week we had in recent days, Jordan, the professional game board or professional board make an announcement of which I hope I'm not wrong in saying wasn't much of an announcement. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I think the same as previous weeks, the game board is, is really anxious to get us back out and playing and we're beginning to see some fruits for, of their labour. Uh, stage one, we have a, a plan for when we can get back into social distancing training, um, which will be in the first couple of weeks in, in June, um, depending or not whether we can uh, tick the boxes and, and get tick off the, the right criteria and keep everyone safe. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a massive positive for us uh, yeah, this week. One announcement that wasn't made, and you had promised, you've promised everyone an announcement. No, you didn't. I'm lying. You said, I've checked the tape. You said, hopefully. So let's clear it up for anyone watching. You said, hopefully, we'd have an announcement this week of a player. I did say that. Uh, and as you correctly identified, I didn't promise because I never break a promise. Uh, and unfortunately, that hope is fading fast. Um, we have got some guys signed, but um, we are not ready to announce them just yet, Sam. So hopefully next week. Oh, don't do that to me. Don't do it to me. I guess it's a question then. What are the difficulties you're facing in terms of locking up deals that you previously might not have in the current uh, situation? Oh, look, it's, it's an unprecedented situation we find ourselves in. Um, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, you know, everything is new. Everything has changed. Um, conversations that would have taken place face to face are now done via Zoom, as are this. And, and they, um you know, we're faced with a, a lot of uncertainty when the season will start and, and, and what that looks like. So there's, there's a lot of questions being asked. Um, the recruitment is, is effectively done and Jan McGinnity has done a great job in around that. Um, so it's a, uh, the difficulty being just, you know, we've got to get agreements across the line and when people start and, and when do they get in the country. Um, there's, there's lots, of a, uh, lots of different permutations that we need to make sure are, are correct before we announce anything. There's obviously the added element of those that aren't playing in the Premiership have different season start and end dates from their own competitions now abroad. Uh, I'm very conscious of saying a competition. I might know one where they're coming. Yeah, up. we're not going to talk about any competitions, but you say you know everybody's in a, in a very different position. Even even guys from the Premiership, um, we're not 100% clear on what it looks like for the guys who are finishing their contracts and the guys who are moving clubs. Um, so. Um, we don't want to jump the gun and, and announce something before it's uh, official. Uh, and for that reason, we'll, we'll just hold and keep our powder dry. It's not as if nobody's been announced. And this is probably a way to bring Chris in on a different angle. But some big names have been announced, Chris, in terms of none other than Namani Nandolo, Kyle Brink, Matt Scott, Shalva, Mamu Kashvili. Is that correct? In the Australian twang. Very good. I'll say yes. Yeah. 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 Zach Henry. So from your point, Chris, as head of brand, where marketing plays one of the more pivotal roles, they are exciting names that you get to put on the brochures, slap on the side of Welford Road and, and see run around in Tigers kit, aren't they? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, um, obviously, no, Nondolo is, is the number one on that for this one because of his presence as well, I guess. You know, one of my, my favourite in my time here was obviously uh, Alessana Tuolagi. If he wanted a good picture for a rugby player, he certainly uh, he was certainly the man for that. Um, but yeah, it's great having, having new guys in with that kind of standard. It gives you something to work on, gets the supporters excited. And I think he, he's definitely a, a bit of box office to add to some great players we've already got. 
he's a good way of segueing you back in, Jordy. Those players that effectively contracts were expected to start from July 1st, we may not see them all from July 1st, will we? Again, we're hoping that they will be with us as near as possible to the start date of their contracts, which is July 1st. And the Manny at present is in France. Um, he's got a, a wife who's due in the next few days. Um, and um, he's also got to get that, that child, when it is born, registered in Paris. And then he's got to get himself over to the UK and get a visa. Uh, currently, visa offices are closed. So there are issues to, to getting him in. Um, he's keen. I've been in contact with Nemani, and, and he's obviously um, got a, uh, stuff going on in his, in his personal life, but he's very keen to get, in, get over and um, get started. Um, so we're hopeful that we can get as many of those guys on site for the 1st of July as possible. And two massive Rottweiler dogs as well. He does. He does. You know, you, people have to look like their dogs. So I, um, in fairness, we put two of them on top of each other, then that's probably what you get with him. I don't know that I look like a French bulldog. Just uh, anyone, anyone who's seen your dog would, could certainly see the resemblance. <laughs> <laughs> so, Geordie, you had everyone talking this week because it was reported that you said it would take eight weeks from the first training day to have, be ready to play rugby. Um, tell me, or talk me through that to clarify something. Um, yeah, there's no real science to that. Uh, that, that is more of a... Uh, a, a picking a figure from thin air as you're doing a radio interview. Um, to be quite honest, where we are right, right now, um, you know, we're looking at playing, we're being told we're looking at playing sort of further down the line. We need, we need to get back. We need to do a couple of weeks, at least two weeks of some running. Uh, and then we need to do some weeks of contact before we bring the, the guys back into, into, a, uh, into game scenarios. So if you look at that as being two weeks and then four weeks of contact training where we can actually physically um, prepare the guys for a game, uh, and then before you go into any premiership game, you would always face a couple of warm-up games just to, to get the guys uh, ready to go. And, and uh, I was working of a, of a 2 4 uh, system uh, of you know, minimum stage. And, and, and that's generally my belief. The guys who have not played a game since March, it's probably the longest time since they've you know, been involved in a tackle situation, a scrum or a mall situation. So um, it's, it's a really difficult situation. I, I don't envisage the guys getting thrown back into competitive games without having done some real physical training beforehand. And, and um, although we haven't got a, a start date, um, we're hopeful of starting, to, being able to start to prepare the guys for a, a start date that would be in around eight weeks down the line or further. The only thing I'd say in terms of, again, letting you off the hook, because good co-hosts do that, is yeah. it's also not your decision. It's the decision of the government and health experts, isn't it? You can't say we're going back and whether or not other teams have done that. We won't go into that. But it's not your decision. It's not Chris's decision. It's not Peter Tom's decision. It's... Yeah, no, look, we're, we're, we're being dictated to from um, a higher power, um, from Premier Rugby and from the government. And uh, I think the, the key thing is everyone seems very keen to get us back out on the field, get the guys out playing and, and everyone who I've spoken to is missing sport and some of the make the calls that we've done. Everyone's desperate to get back out and watch some, some rugby or watch rugby, at least on television. So um, we're all on the same page, but obviously we're all acutely aware of, of the situation that we're in and how severe the, the pandemic is. And, and we, we won't risk anybody in our organization health or anybody sort of of our fans health. So it's a, um, it's a difficult one because, you know, I think in regards to when would we be ready to play, um, we will need a. We will need some time. Um, when we actually are playing, will be dictated to us. Chris, from your point of view, I mean, obviously, a lot of fans are wondering what's going on in terms of when they will see rugby again on TV or in stadia. If eight weeks is the magic number to return around a team, I would imagine that you can't just open the gates at Welford Road and be a hundred percent ready with staff furloughed and other staff in working from home. What's the likelihood or what's the number that you would say in terms of Tigers being ready to host a game again? Well, I guess, uh, you know, unlike Geordie, who's a co-host and then has to back up the numbers he picks up from fresh air, I'm unlikely to be back anytime soon. <laughs> so, I can, so I can probably make some guesses. But, um, you know, the, for, for us, it, it's, not about, it's not about guessing. Um, you know, I think we've said no, no end of times um, for, for us. Geordie has a, a reasonable idea of what it takes to get the players from a start to a finish. We have no idea what the scenario is that we're going back into. 
everyone's seen them. There's, there's four, five, six, seven, eight different scenarios. Is there any crowds? Is there no crowds? Do we have shops open? Do we not have shops open? Do we have retail? Do we, do we not have uh, um, food available? Do we not have hospitality? There's so many connotations of what can happen. We have very much said that, you know, we, we have an answer to every single question, you know, with a group of staff that we've had have worked really hard on it. We've got working groups on how we get staff back in, how we get, how we get the supporters back in, um, how we play behind closed doors. It, all those things are things we want to progress, but we've said all the way along that we can't give you information until we know an answer, because we think if we speculate on something, then we're just going to create all sorts of other questions. So for us, we, we've got all the plans in place. Our, our goal is to get people back safely. That's the, that's the number one thing, as Geordie said, we're not going to risk anything unnecessarily. And I think Peter Tom has been really strong with us that, Let's the Tigers will only start doing these things when we're happy we can do it without any unnecessary risk. Obviously, there's no hiding from the fact that there's going to be and has been financial implications on all sports clubs around the world. It's not limited to rugby. It's not limited to Leicester Tigers. I guess the question would be that while we're very proud of our supporter base and having the largest supporter base, it's almost we've created a problem with fans by having the biggest supporter base because we rely on those guys each match day. Is that right? Like, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, you know, if you're committing me to say that our supporters are a problem, I, I don't think I'm going to go down that route. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it, it is. We, we have the biggest risk. We, we have the biggest risk out there. You have the mo mo most supporters. You have the most hospitality. You, you have those kind of things that, that are, are sitting out there. You have the biggest risk when it comes to things changing. And uh, we obviously have the biggest upside on, on the other end of it as well. But we very much have, um, have that in mind. We have more supporters to deal with when it comes to it. Um, and we're saying that, you know, the best quote I've heard is, is unprecedented times. You have to make unprecedented decisions. And for us, you know, we have to make sure that we know an answer before we get it out there because you know we we've said there's a bit of a log jam whatever happens we have the most people to deal with and uh you know we're not as you said we're not the only club that's involved in this and there's wildly different situations amongst even the the 12 clubs in our league so for us we know we've got it there we've got all our scenarios mapped out and all we know is that we don't have a history of not looking after our supporters quite the opposite uh, and we'll make sure that that they're looked after when the time comes and we can do what's right. Um, but we also know that, you know, not playing rugby, uh, rugby is our business. We haven't played rugby for some time. We might not play rugby for some time moving forwards, uh, depending on things well outside of our four walls. And what that means going forward is that, that we have to ask people to help us out. We, first, with some patience, but secondly, with finances. You know, uh, the three people on, on this call have all, all, all taken, you know, their share of, uh, of trying to solve the problem. All the players have, all the staff have. Um, and, you know, we'll ask supporters to help us, you know, a little bit of the future. Our future's in their hands when it comes to that. So, you know, we, we will look after people, but um, we might ask for some help as well. I think, I think we're in a lucky position there as well, though, Chris. You know, I always say tough times, uh, people really stand up and you find a, a lot about people when, when times are tough. And, and certainly that was the case um, over the course of the last while in, in the field. I, I really felt that um, certainly the real supporters at Welford Road stood up and were counted and, and were very vocal and, and really got in behind the club when things weren't going well on the field. Um, which really gives me a huge amount of faith that, you know, in times like this, that everyone is appreciative that it's it's unprecedented and it's unknown and, and um, it's difficult um, that our supporters are just itching. And again, the ones I've spoken to, the fans uh, on the phones and, and from the, the random touches I've had in, in, in being out in supermarkets, our fans are, are, are really keen to, to get in behind us. We, we, without a shadow of a doubt, have the best fans um, and... Yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think we're going to be a um, we'll be in a stronger place on the other side of this. Obviously, so, social distancing in those conversations. <laughs> <in the same. laughs> Very much so. Yelling, <laughs> yelling from two meters away. That you. We, we, we had a okay. conversation with uh, we had a conversation with supporters this week, and mm -hmm. the first thing they asked was, "What could they do to help?" And it's always a bit humbling, isn't it? When you know we we've gone out. I know, Jordy, you've done some of the calls to our supporters as well. What can we do to help them? But you know, when they're there, they're They've asked us, what can we do? Um, you know, and it's come from 
a gentleman who had some some HR management experience and what he could do to people uh, saying they'll help us uh, uh, open the boxes for the shop when they arrive. Pe people want to help, and uh, you know you you get to be a bit humbled by how much everyone loves the club and wants to be there for us in difficult times. So you're right, Geordie Spahn. It's a strange one too, isn't it? Because you in the last or past decade, Leicester Tigers and rugby's grown rapidly and it's become a business, it's become a brand, there's no question. I mean, you're ahead of brand. I don't think those titles existed two decades ago. But this time, for me anyway, and I'm sure you two know what I'm talking about, is it's very much reminded me that it is a rugby club and people genuinely love it. We're not a business by name. We are a rugby club. So it's going to be an interesting time ahead. But I guess, Chris, one thing I'd ask, and while I appreciate what you're saying is, you don't want to muddy waters like, you know, media articles might in terms of suspecting certain outcomes. But if you take the risk of running an eye over fan forums or uh, social media pages, you do see a lot of questions about, you know, refunds, paying for next season, um, direct debits, all the buzzwords around season tickets or events that have been booked in, etc. What I guess I'm asking you is, it's not as if you and your teams are not planning for all outcomes, you are looking at all potential outcomes. It's just that you don't want to necessarily tell people yet because it's not your call. Yeah, uh, I think, um, and the first view of all of us is that it, it's how we look after the supporters in this. You know, we are a long-term business. Um, you don't continue a long-term business or a long-term club based on upsetting your long-term supporters. You know, Peter Tom's said, no end of times again to bring him up again is that you know we've been around for 140 years he wants us to be around for another 140 years that is his goal of this period of time when it's so difficult and so off you know you, you don't stay around for another 140 years by not looking after your supporters um but from our perspective we go out and and say the wrong things at the wrong time and it doesn't just affect us it affects all the teams in the league uh, you know they've all got to put their everything in order um some might be further along than others but we all have to be ready with the right story because if we jump the gun it, it literally ruins everything and and we can't say what the answer is we are being determined to by by actually number one a virus number two by then the government by the leagues by the governing bodies everything else and so that those are all the things we've got to wait for we we can only ask for patience um and hopefully a little bit of faith that that we don't get it wrong too often and the, the number one point for us is making sure we've got supporters in two years time i guess if i can obviously people have thrown around the idea of behind closed doors we don't know we don't know what will happen when the season will recommence if it will recommence i'm not going to enter into that conversation geordie you've been a part of a lot of team runs on a friday before a saturday my biggest fear is if rugby is played behind closed doors is just how much the language and words on the pitch might be picked up by pitch side microphones. Is that something you would have to tell the team? Um, I Certainly actually, not with you not playing anymore. I'm a little less worried. But. I hadn't actually considered it, to be quite honest with you, Sam, um, until just now. Um, I was, thought you were going down the route of uh, yeah, the atmosphere and obviously that was, was the effect. <laughs> and you come straight to a base level of how much do the players swear. Uh, I, I think it would be interesting to, to hear some of the collisions that take place yeah. um, and actually yeah. hear that the smacks and the cracks that come out of big tackles um, would probably uh, be a real awareness uh, for the fans of what the players go through. Uh, I'm sure the, the, the commentators would have to uh, apologise on occasion for some, mm. of the, uh, some of the choice of wording used by the players and, and some of the horrific banter by others, to be quite honest with you. So, um, yeah, it's a, maybe, maybe they'll pipe a uh, fan's music in if it is played behind closed doors. I guess the other fear is the language that might echo from the Crumbies coach's box. <laughs> yeah, well, to be quite honest with you, Steve is very thoughtful with the way he speaks. And, and I'm obviously on the back of my, um, my ban at the beginning of, of last or this season. 12 months ago this week. It seems so long ago. Um, I'm, a months ago. I'm a completely different character in the stand now. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. Because you're not. <laughs> I understand I am. It's when I when I go near the pitch, that's the issue. 
<laughs> yes, yes. We'll walk down those crumby steps. No, We're not no. talking about it. We're not talking about it. Jordy, it's a good chance to actually chat rugby for a second. One thing we haven't really chatted about because we haven't had a game to discuss is injuries. So there was a couple of guys with some long-term injuries when we went into the break. I'm highlighting probably Yaku, Sam Asplin, Robinson, uh, young Henry Lavin. Is there any update on where they're at? And obviously the opportunity for them to potentially use the time more wisely than others. Yeah, I suppose for the guys who are long-term injury injured, um, every it's a silver lining to the cloud. Um, guys like Sam have... Uh, I think Sam's got a, a screw in, in his ankle that needs to come out. So obviously NHS isn't operating at the moment, so we won't be able to get him in to do that until they're back up and running. So he's still a little while off, but obviously made huge progress, as has Yaku and, and a, um, Henry Lavin the same. You know, Henry Lav- Lavin had a, an ACL injury, which is effectively a season-long injury in nine months. And, and now I think he's out of a brace and he started to uh, yeah, cycle and started to walk and run. So um, I suppose if there is any silver lining to a cloud those guys who were long-term injured um will have reaped the benefits of, of having some time to rehab um, any all of the players who i've spoken to uh, are all uh feeling fresh and you know their bodies feel good from not having had to do contact for, for, for a little while they're all they've all been looking after their bodies and, and training but the actual uh, running into each other does take its toll so i suppose from from that point of view it's it's been nice for the players to uh, get a bit of a rest from the the the, the bangs shall we say the other one is obviously johnny mcphillips um who suffered the injury didn't he in the final game away to saris the other one who i guess is one out of this situation is tom young's missing some potential weeks on the sideline for a little bit of yeah well, it was interesting i thought it was smart from world rugby's point of view to a uh to just let the, let the bands run. Um, Joe Marler and Tom, probably two of the, the more high-profile cases that won't actually see any uh, field time. But um, I, I think Tom and guys like that who have come off the back of red cards, they'll have to be careful in the, in the, in the coming season in that um, that will stand against their names and any further indiscretions will certainly cost us as a team. So it's a, uh, um, although they won't miss game time, it certainly does put them on, a, on the naughty list. I think I saw someone say that the Marla decision was nuts, but I'll just let you sit on that one for a little while. I have heard that. It was a comedy show as well, I didn't realise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on fire this week. Jordy. Uh, not so much of the smiles. Um, I guess an announcement today made by the club in terms of what forms part of the new look and the reset required at Oval Park, and everyone's put their hands up and acknowledged the required need for some changes um, some changes at academy level in terms of the departures of Jed Glynn and David Mele, two people you've worked with and known for a long time I'll probably follow it with a question because given your move into a director of rugby role I would assume that this is maybe around streamlining that feeding into you overseeing all of the rugby departments now at Oval Park not just the senior program yeah, firstly, it's never nice to a um, to lose people and, and friends like Jed and, and a, a Dav, um, who I've known for for a long time and worked with for a long time, and, and both have had you know enormous contributions to to Leicester Tigers over the course. Jed a longer period than, than Dav, but Dav obviously played for us as well. So um, it's sad to, to to see those guys move on. But but as you said, um, you know it's a um, we're in a position where we've got some very good people in in that environment. That, that David Wilkes has been involved in that environment for a long time. Matt Smith, obviously, some great experience and developed massively over the course of the year. Um, and with myself moving roles into that director of rugby, um, some of that those responsibilities will fall under my remit of uh, of a uh, you know overwatch of, of of the development pathway of, of players. So um, although it's a uh, it's it's never nice. It's 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 you know been brought about by by COVID and, and a, um, it's, it's where we are looking forward and, and the journey is, a, as we said, has begun and, and something that will fall on my plate to, a, uh, to look after. So you mentioned that on your plate as a DOR, you're not necessarily picking the academy team or coaching the academy team. Are you, are you just making sure that those guys making their way up the ranks are the kinds of players that Steve needs in the first team? Yeah, definitely. So, so, so Steve will be running um, the rugby program, and, and that's uh, something that I will work with him hand in glove and, and that side by side in, in relation to you know what's best for Leicester Tigers. But how we transition those guys from the academy, where we get game time, 
um, and how they progress into the first team setup and into the first team squad is something that we need to work on as a club and, and I will oversee all of that. So if that's what a DOR does, Chris, what does a head of brand do? I like the way he gave you this question at the very top end, Chris. So I'm yeah, expecting, you, I'm expecting you answers to come you. up with an answer, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure if you ask my colleagues, of which you're one, Sam, that not a lot would probably be the answer. Um, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a title which is all around the badge. So it actually comes across quite corporate it, when you say it, but for us, it means something different. It's anything that involves the badge, anything that involves the supporters, anything that involves our community activities, um, you know, with the retail coming in house again, because that's a supporter thing that that is something that, that owns the badge. And so it's my job to protect everything we do around the badge and the people that love it the most, I guess. So um, that's what a head of a brand is for me and particularly, you know, the ticket office, community, the Marcom's team, we're, we're quite unique in the way we're set up in the community are absolutely a part of the club, right in it, same offices, all those kind of things. And we see that as a big part of what leads us commercially as well as, as what we do. You know, that that's always been a community club. Part of the reason I think so many of us are, uh, I love the club and stick around is because of that community feel. And so, yeah, that, that's what it means for us, or at least, at least what it means for me, I guess. So, I would imagine community is taking probably one of the bigger hits at the moment, certainly with its links to global partner clubs who are going through their own struggles, depending on how that nation is, is handling the virus, some better than others, I would say. Um, but as a community department and the programs, I'd imagine there's not a lot of things going on. Well, it's a, it, it's a knock on effect, isn't it? You know, uh, to, to say it's worse affected, probably uh, I wouldn't want to belittle anything else that was happening to everyone else out there. You know, the club itself is, 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 you know, having a, its own problems and challenges, but, you know, particularly with charity being maybe a bit more of a discretionary spend and some of the things we're trying to do there. Um, most of our fundraising happens on match day um, or, or from our events, you know, the, the wheelchair rugby team is, is funded through what we do with the Tigers challenge um, which is a massive event that we hold at two Butlins weekends um, and from our rugby camps, uh, not, not, none of which we, will be going ahead this summer. Um, and so all those kind of holes that we have to fill mean that the, the problem for the club is wider than just rugby activities. You know, we, we're going to try our very best to fund all the rugby activities, but there's these things on the side, you know, working towards what we the, the local community action that we've been doing with teams like the Swifts, uh, putting together wheelchair rugby team and our SEND program around that, the inclusion days we're running, all those things um, were, were, were put together from what we could we could pull together on, on the side, so to speak, and and that's that's all gone. And um, you know we're trying, we've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of padding in the foundation, so we. We, we, we can keep it going, but but ultimately the new money's not coming in. And, uh, you know, from that perspective, it's a real challenge and for something that we all feel passionately about, you know, we've got to work really hard as trustees and, and, and as the club to try and keep that stuff rolling. So, look, you opened the door to this, so I'm going to ask the question. Um, bring in the retail back in-house. Long-term process, project. Didn't just happen overnight, did it? No, you know we, we we've had a we, we've had a long term deal with Fanatics to to run our to, to run our retail and and we've had a great relationship over nine ten years with those guys. Um, I think we felt it was right along with um, with the catering to get a bit more control on it, and we've had new caterers as well in that period. Um, and I think we were keen that you know from my perspective. Uh, I can't affect the rugby quite as much as Geordie does. Um, and so we have to work around everything else that we do. And, and we want everything to be the best quality. You know, number one, the standards we set, whatever we're doing, it's the best. And I think for us, a, a lot of times that means taking more control. Um, and with the retail, it's something we've been working on for some time. You know, it's a big, it's a big operation to run and, and take on board. Uh, and certainly timing is wonderful for it at the moment. But uh, it's one where we believe that we wanted to give the supporters what they wanted and we're closest to them. So we hope we can do that and, um, and make it a real success. So Samurai coming in house or Samurai or however you say it, I'll double check it with everyone. But 
Jordy, you guys have been involved to a point. Obviously, Clive the Kit Man, famous to all fans, um, has been involved as well. Samurai is an exciting, I guess, brand to have making Tigers Kit, isn't it? Yeah, really exciting brand. Um, Chris had us involved in the decision making process all along and we obviously went through due diligence with with regards to some some uh, other companies but um for me i was hugely impressed with the samurai kit um they came in they presented really well the quality of the kit is exceptional um and you know they're willing to work with us and and, and help us make the, the kit that we want as well so um they've sort of uh, said that you know nothing is is not achievable and, and a really great attitude from them. Uh, I think they were a great find and Chris has done a great job with them, but I'm, I'm really excited about the kits that they're uh, producing and the quality of it is, is, is important. Will we see face masks, Chris? Uh, yeah, oh, we, we, we will we, literally see them. We, we, we may do, Sam, yes. So uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've, we've got some on the way. Uh, again, you know, we, we, we don't pick up the retail operation for a few weeks yet, so... Um, they, they will be available when we get to there, but that's just just some of the things. I think just echoing what Geordie said, the, the number one choice for us was about making sure that we could deliver the quality and have someone that was really going to work with us. And Terry and Keeley at, at uh, Samurai, whose head office is based in Norwich, um, uh, with which I'm a big fan, being a Norfolk boy myself, um, was uh, was really interested. You know, they were so keen. They're just massive rugby people, and you know, it is a different sport. And so, you know. The clothes uh, uh, did need to be designed that way, and, and we felt they gave us the best opportunity of of giving the supporters something that they liked. And uh, seeing as we had to put our name to it now, um, I wanted to make sure we got it right. So let me ask you some quick questions then that you don't need to go into too much detail about. Will we see an academy kit being sold? Uh, we will have some heritage coloured clothes to, <laughs> to purchase. <laughs> when will we see the new kit for the first time? Uh, we're going to reveal uh, the kit at the end of June. Home and? Home and change, yes. Home and change kit. And my understanding, speaking of someone who knows a little bit about what's coming, is that both are very exciting for different reasons. Uh, yeah, I, I like so. Our our plan with the retail operation is that we think that there's there's two sides to to rugby supporters gear. One one is the traditional cotton shirts, and one is the kind of new style playing shirts. So we are going something fresh and different um, for for the two shirts. Uh, very you know a home shirt that you I can exclusively uh, reveal is green, red, and white, um, and, and would very much be be noticeable as a Tigers shirt, but you know, we, we want it to be there. We want, want it to get some emotion. We want it to get opinion. Um, we don't want people to worry too much. I, I, don't, think, uh, I don't think they'll be disappointed. We're, we're backing it a lot. But that's going to be next to a whole new retro range of cotton shirts so that there's a real choice for people. Um, and with Samurai, we've got the opportunity to try things. So some things will work, some things won't work. And what we want people is to give us loads of feedback. You know, uh, the only way we'll be successful is if we put the right things in the shop that people want. So um, for us, it's very much a case of try it. If it works, we'll get some more. And if it doesn't, well, we'll learn from it. So not just a new look squad and coaching team, a new look, literally. Yeah, quite. Yeah, absolutely. It fits in with, fits in with the direction we're going. So... Back to rugby and Geordie, before we do finish and I ask you the inevitable question about trying to get an announcement out of you about the playing squad, um, I wanted to ask you about Pap Howard because for fans this weekend, we are going to release an interview with Pap from Australia, uh, looking back on his review of which um, you could say laid the foundations for some of the decisions that have been made in recent weeks and COVID-19 has inevitably sped up. But I want to ask you not only about Pat's time here, but also he talks in the interview about his interactions with you and the way in which he, you know, he helped you. Um, so when Pat came in, Geordie, just to clarify, it, it wasn't a babysitting job. <laughs> it was a case of Pat coming in just to sweep out some cobwebs, you could say, and clear up some 
some lines of, of reporting, clear up some avenues of things that needed just maybe a look in the mirror, I think was his phrase. Oh yeah, look, it was, it was important to do. I, I felt, we felt that, you know, things weren't going well. I had been parachuted into a position that um, I, I was probably not quite prepared for in, in all honesty. Um, and I think he was absolutely brilliant. You know, Pat's an incredibly honest guy. He's, he's a friend of mine. I don't, I don't think he'd mind me saying that he's brutal in his honesty. He came in and just threw things around. Um, he sort of said, look, this wasn't the same environment culturally that we had when we were successful. And, and that was probably fair. And we probably eroded that over the course of, of the previous few years and, and with a little bit of lack of direction. Um, he grilled me uh, on my thoughts on rugby, on my thoughts on where Leicester Tigers should be. Um, and when we got all those down, he said, right, well, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's push it through. Um, so he helped me as an individual uh, hugely in that sort of just really put me on a path and gave me the belief both in myself and in, in my thoughts that that's, that's a solid plan to, to work from. But, you know, Pat went into the board, uh, he went into Peter Tom, went into to Simon Cohen, who, who was CEO at the time, and was brutally direct and asked questions that were thought-provoking and made us all look internally and, and really come out with a plan which leads us to where we are today. Um, you know, the the... the, the Plan started very much when Pat was over over the course of his uh, numerous visits to the club. I think he was here six or seven times for sort of three or four days at a time. Um, but the plan started really with Pat at day one, and and um, he was hugely influential in that, um, hugely influential in, in, in instrumenting some of the changes that we're we're sort of seeing now. Um, so um, I think Pat, I haven't seen the interview, but I'm sure he he will talk about how fond he is of Leicester and and how much it means to him. He wants us to be back on, on the right course, and certainly I, I believe that we are, and it's been a really exciting journey, uh, a tough journey, and we've had some tough lessons to learn, and we've um, not been as good as we, as we could have been on, on field, but have been addressing all of those things on a weekly basis, and, and um, I think we're, we're setting ourselves quite ni nicely to launch. I think two points on that in particular one i found out of the the chat with pat was he'd also worked quite closely with andrea which given recent events is only a good thing for the club um andrea was essentially i hope i'm sure she won't mind me saying charged with implementing a lot of the recommendations that the club took on board from pat but the second one is probably a question for chris because as jordan alludes to it wasn't necessarily that pat was just at oval park and then back on a plane to australia he was involved across the business he had some very honest conversations with the chairman who's spoken about them and will speak about them when we catch up with him again but chris he also had some influence at welford road didn't he yeah absolutely and and you know what came out of that report which was built built by pat and and the um but perhaps more importantly the board and the executives as well is that it was those steps that we've put in place over the last year so we're seeing a lot of the end result of, of those pieces but it was across the board it, it, you know this wasn't um oval park exclusive the whole club needs to get behind it you know we're all in one direction it's all about getting the best team we possibly can on the pitch and that's what that's the only reason that, that the rest of us exist for really and the sport has come for that and yes we want to do the whole community piece and we're a big part of it but it was driven that all of us had to be going in that same direction and that you know in every single area were we set in the highest of standards and and you know Pat helped drive that together and and you know Andrew was the person that was kind of given that to run and and make sure all those points happened and and the rest of us have been have been driving it as well so it's been uh, it's been the culmination of it and uh, it's interesting to see where we've got to it's certainly some some good good changes I think well, Sunday night on LTTV two Australians having an honest conversation what could go wrong what could oh. go wrong a lot is the answer to that. A lot. Yes. I'll, I'll probably refer you to the question about um, uh, captains running the language, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it might be my language that's the issue at the captains <laughs> run then. So, Jordy, just to finish then, hopefully, 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 you might have an announcement next week, but no guarantee. No guarantee, Sam. Uh, unfortunately, I would love to be able to promise, but I don't break promises. So hopefully we'll be able to update you with some further recruitment banter next week. But what I can say is that we will, in the coming weeks, months, I don't know what date it is, as I said at the top of the show, but we are going to catch up with three new additions to the club who are the board members. So Duncan, 
Binton and Peter. Um, I hope they don't mind me using their first names. They do. Never call they do. a board member. Yeah, maybe. that's it. Those interviews won't happen because <laughs> I won't be here. <laughs> They're uh, for you and I. Uh, no, 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 again, some of, some of the, uh, the bits and pieces that we've, we've implemented is, is some changing around the board and, and those three guys I think will make really interesting uh, interviews. And another catch up with Peter, Tom and Andrea because we've got three more weeks, Geordie, until we can put Andrea on the spot for her plan, she promised. Um, that's, that's harsh from you, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate both of you taking the time out. Obviously, Jordan, great to see the different angle of your room. Next week, we'll be in the other corner. So I'll shift us around. Change. I'll make some changes next week. Don't worry. <laughs> and Chris, you just hold on to that shirt. Maybe next time we speak to you, Chris, you'll have the new shirts behind you. Maybe yeah, that's... Could be. could be, yeah. As long as it's after the end of June, yes. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to say, Chris, is that mask looked very small. I didn't want to see you try and put that on unless your ears get yeah. snapped off. I appreciate that, Geordie. It could be something to do with me being very large, right? <laughs> it looks a little bit like really small swimming trunks. So... Oh, we're not going there, I think. <laughs> Test that out. Let us know what it looks like. That's why he didn't put it on his face, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> what a perfect way to finish because it's dinner time and people, you know, don't want to feel like that as they're eating. So appreciate both of you catching up. And next week, I don't know who we're speaking to, Geordie. So we'll see what happens. We'll get someone big, someone, someone big and, and important. Like Chris. There you go. Well, I certainly had the big bit tied up, but perhaps not the important bit. <laughs> See how we go. Have All a good right. evening. Have a good long weekend. Cheers. Cheers. You too. Thank you, gentlemen.